accepted. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you very much for coming along to this afternoon's session uh, on Zambrano carers in the aftermath of the Akinsanya case. Um, my name is Nicole Mastering. I'm an immigration solicitor at the Charity Rights of Women, and I have the pleasure of chairing today's event. Um, before I give a brief introduction, let me address just some basic housekeeping rules for the session today. So uh, this session is being recorded, so you can see that in the corner with a little uh, recording symbol. You've all got your cameras and microphones automatically turned off because we're in Zoom webinar format. Um, there is going to be time for questions and discussion after the panel members have spoken. Uh, and those of you that are familiar with this format will know that there's a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen where you can type in your questions. So please do use that function for your questions, the Q&A one, um, and have a look through uh, before you draft your question to see if anyone has asked the same one, because instead of rewriting it, you can upvote it. So it goes up the priority list and we can make sure that we answer that. Uh, when you're putting, when you're drafting questions, do remember that this is uh, a legal information session. This is not a space to seek legal advice, either about your own case or about a case that you might be working on. So this is not an advice forum. So do don't please don't ask questions specifically about individual cases you're working on, but definitely uh, do pose uh, questions about the issues that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, you'll see that there's a chat function down there as well that you're probably more used to. Use the chat, but not for questions for the panelists, otherwise we might, might not spot them. So use the chat to talk to each other, uh, share your experiences and make comments as well. We're really keen to encourage that. Okay, so by way of introduction for those who don't know me or uh, my charity, which is Rights of Women, uh, we have extensive experience of working around the EU settlement scheme, having been engaged in quite a lot of influencing work in this space since before, uh, since around 2018, before the scheme was launched. And then since the private beta testing phase, which was in November 2018, we've been providing advice and assistance to uh, vulnerable migrant women needing to apply to the scheme. Now, we've been particularly concerned about non-EU citizens uh, who are uh, primary carers of children with derivative rights of residence. And that's because in our experience, they're predominantly women who are sole carers of young children. Many have been subjected to domestic abuse from their former partners, and many have experienced considerable financial hardship due to their caring responsibilities. And in the case of Zambrano right holders, of course, uh, ineligibility for benefits just makes this considerably worse. Uh, and we find that derivative rights, of course, are relied on as a last resort, and applicants are commonly more vulnerable as a consequence of that. So the background to where we are today is sort of despite agreeing to include Zambrano carers under the EU settlement scheme, when that route was introduced back in May 2019, the government's clear approach was to exclude as many uh, carers of British citizens as possible from the EU settlement scheme and instead to direct them towards the Appendix FM, uh, Appendix FM parent route. And at the time, for the first time, we were introduced to the Home Office's new view on when an EU Zambrano right of residence could arise in law. Their view that they told us in 2019 was that there could be no Zambrano right of residence at any time that a person had limited leave in the UK. And there could be no Zambrano right of residence at any time that a person who didn't have leave but had a realistic prospect of obtaining Article 8 limited leave if they were to make an application. So it was in that context in which Ms. Akinsanya made her EU settlement scheme Zambrano application. And she's not the only one who did that, of course. Up to, we've uh, been looking at the statistics that the government releases and up until the end of December 2021, uh, that tells us that there've been now over 11,000 EU settlement scheme Zambrano applications. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Akinsanya's legal team today, and hopefully you can see them all on your screen. We have Solicitor Bea Rivers of Hackney Community Law Centre, and barristers Simon Cox and Mike Spencer of Doughty Street Chambers. Now, together, they're going to talk you through January's Court of Appeal judgment uh, in the case of Akinsanya, the implications of it as far as anyone could possibly say at this stage, and the practicalities of making an EUSS Zambrano application. They'll also be touching on some possible future issues that uh, will be affecting Zambrano carers. 
Now, before I hand over to them, I'm just going to manage your expectations a little as well um, to make clear that now Ms. Akinsanya won her day in court. She won her case in the Court of Appeal. But that doesn't mean that she's going to be granted status under the EU settlement scheme. And despite all their collective brilliance, her legal team can't tell her what the outcome of her case will be. That's because that will largely be determined by what the Home Office chooses to do next, which still is unknown to all of us in this room at the moment. So to explain this and a whole lot more, uh, I'm now going to hand over to Mike to start discussing the judgment. Uh, and there's going to be some slides, and I'm sure Doughty Street will make sure that those slides are made available uh, at the end of the session. So over to you, Mike. Thank you, Nicole, um, for that extremely thorough introduction. Uh, if we could turn to the next slide, please, Richard. So some of you uh, may have been with us back in June when we had a SNAP webinar looking at the High Court judgment in Akinsanya, uh, which is up there, uh, the reference is up there, and that was on the 9th of June. So some of what I'm gonna say in this talk repeats what we talked about then. But since then, of course, we've had a judgment of the Court of Appeal on the 25th of January, 2022. Uh, and the Court of Appeal reached slightly different conclusions on uh, at least one of the core issues of law. So I'm going to take you through that also. Um, before I do that, in brief, what is Akinsanya about? Um, well, Nicole has um, refigured that somewhat, um, but basically it's about whether the Secretary of State uh, or the Home Secretary got the law wrong when framing the rules for Zambrano carers under the EU settlement scheme. And in particular, uh, whether they got the law wrong looking uh, in excluding those who already have limited leave to remain on another basis, for example, under Appendix FM. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry. Uh, back to basics. What is a Zambrano carer? Uh, now, that's actually an issue of some controversy and one of the core issues in Akinsanya, as we'll see. Uh, but at its, at its most basic, it's a situation where you have a third country national primary carer. So that's someone who is not a British citizen or an EEA citizen, um, who is the primary carer of a British citizen, usually a child, in circumstances where that British citizen child would be unable to reside in the UK or in any other EEA member state if the primary care carer were required to leave. Now that's essentially the definition as in the EEA regulations. As we'll see, that's not quite coterminous with the definition under EU law. Where does Zambrano come from? If we can turn to the next slide, please. Essentially, it's a creature of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Um, most uh, uh, most uh, residence rights under EU law come from Article 21 of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union. That's about free movement. And they usually involve some sort of cross-border movement between member states. Zambrano is quite unusual because it's not about free movement, it's about citizenship. And it derives from Article 20, uh, which is establishes European Union citizenship and it's entirely internal. Zambrano was a case about a Colombian father of a Belgian citizen child. Uh, and the issue is whether the Colombian father should be de denied or should be given the right to work in Belgium so that the child can make use of their citizenship as, a, as an EU citizen within Belgium. And the Court of Justice basically said, if you make the father leave and return to Colombia, um, then the child will have to go with him uh, and then in doing so, you'll deny the child the genuine enjoyment of the substance of their rights as an EU citizen. Uh, um, it's a derivative right that derives from the child's rights as an EU citizen, and it's cross, so somewhat controversial because of that lack of cross-border element. And that's why in subsequent cases, which we don't need to go through now, the Court of Justice rode back somewhat and tried to limit the scope of the Zambrano right. Next slide, please. Uh, in the UK, however, um, the UK implemented the Zambrano right through the EEA regulations. First, the EEA regulations 26, 2006, which were amended in 2012, and eventually became this, which is regulation 16 of the 2016 version of the regulations. 
and that attempted to formulate uh, into a into a, a UK domestic rule the essence of the Zambrano right and it followed the definition as I've just referred to it looking in particular about whether that British citizen child would be unable to reside in the UK if the parent was required to leave crucially and importantly as we'll see in Akinsanya there were exemptions um, and including particularly for those who have indefinite leave to remain but there was no exemption for people who have limited leave to remain they could still satisfy the requirements of regulation 16. next slide please and in fact that was actually confirmed by the home office in their guidance uh, which specifically and explicitly said if you have limited leave to remain then you can acquire a derivative right of residence as a zambrano carer under regulation 16. next slide please and then story continues as nicole's um, mentioned suddenly in may 2019 we had a shift in guidance or shift in position we don't it's not entirely clear why that was and we don't need to go into that but essentially the secretary of state turned around and said no actually my view of the law has changed uh, and you can't have a zambrano right of residence under regulation 16 or under eu law if you already have limited leave to remain and actually the guidance went further as we see here and said even if you could apply for limited leave to remain on some other basis under Appendix FM. So even if you could make an application or you've been refused one, but your circumstances have changed, so you now can make an application, you have to do that first before you can make a Zambrano application. Uh, and as Nicole indicated, that excluded a lot of people when we think of the Zambrano cohort, which is um, mainly uh, single mothers with British citizen children. Um, since many of them would be eligible under Appendix F and parent route, that excluded them, them from the Zambrano right. That didn't matter so much uh, until the introduction of the EU settlement scheme. And we turn to the next slide, please. Uh, as Nicole's indicated, the Secretary of State was generous and, and um, didn't, she didn't have to do this because the withdrawal agreement doesn't cover Zambrano carers um, by including them within the EU settlement scheme. But she gave with one hand and took away with another because she then crafted a very uh, restrictive definition which explicitly excludes anybody from having a zambrano or falling within the definition of the zambrano right to reside for the purposes of the eu settlement scheme if you already have leave to enter or remain uh, unless granted under appendix eu um so the issue in akinsanya was a challenge to this subparagraph subparagraph b of the definition of um, a Zam person with a Zambrano right to reside under the EU settlement scheme. Next slide, please. Uh, there were no numerous grounds in the challenge, but through various concessions, we focused on two particular issues in the case. Did the Secretary of State get the law wrong in her understanding of, firstly, the Zambrano jurisprudence at the EU level, so the scope of the EU law right to reside uh, under Zambrano, and secondly, her interpretation of Regulation 16 of the EEA regulations. And the Secretary of State accepted that if the answer to either of those questions was yes, she got the law wrong, then she erred in law when she framed paragraph B, and she would have to go again and reconsider the rules. Uh, next slide, please. High Court judgment from Mostyn, uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn, as we saw back in June, he answered both questions in the, affirmat in the affirmative. Yes, they got the law wrong in, in terms of the EU law, because the Zambrano right is not extinguished by the existence of limited leave to remain. And yes, you also got the law wrong under Regulation 16, because it's clear, and the Secretary of State can't expect the court to draft uh, Regulation 16 for her. Uh, and Mr. Justin, uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn, next slide, please, um, gave a number of, uh, uh, of forms of relief, quashed the decision in Ms. Akinsanya's case, and a declaration that the Secretary of State had erred in law, and also that the guidance was wrong. Uh, and finally, left over the question of whether he would quash paragraph B of the, EU, of the definition of a person with Zambrano right to reside to another date. Uh, and that issue of the, 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 the further relief was stayed. So we then go to the Court of Appeal. Next slide, please. Who answered those two questions slightly differently? The Court of Appeal said, actually, no, the Secretary of State was right about the Zambrano jurisprudence. She got the EU law question right. Uh, and that's because 
the Zambrano right does not arise as long as somebody has a domestic law right to remain or the right to work or receive social assistance. Um, but she did get the domestic law, the Regulation 16 of the EEA regulations wrong, because the wording of Regulation 16 is far too clear to be construed in any other way. So even though Regulation 16 went further than EU law required, there's no obligation for the court to read it down. Uh, so we have this strange position where the EU law position and the domestic law, EEA regulations position, is different. And so somebody might have a right to reside as a Zambrano care under, under Regulation 16, but not have any right to reside under EU law. Uh, next um, slide, please. Looking a bit more at the Court of Appeal judgment, what uh, Lord Justice Underhill said is that as soon as the Zambrano carer loses their domestic leave, then the Zambrano right arises. So it's only once you've lost your limited leave that the Zambrano comes to the fore. And that's because Zambrano is waiting in the rings and it has to be there. Uh, it has to ensure that you're never put in a position or the carer is never put in a position where their residence becomes unlawful, as long as they meet the Zambrano conditions for derivative residence. Next slide, please. Um, what the court couldn't answer is what the Secretary of State was really trying to do when she framed the EU settlement scheme. That's a question that the court wasn't able to answer. If her intention uh, was simply to restrict to those people whose right depended on EU law, then there was nothing wrong with paragraph B as drafted. But if our intention was intended to extend to all of those who, would, who if they removed, would meet the Zambrano circumstances, uh, then paragraph B is obviously inconsistent with that. So the real question now is, what is the Secretary of State actually trying to achieve in including Zambrano carers within the scope of the EU settlement scheme? Uh, next slide, please. The, the Court of Appeal amended Mr. Jorston's order only in relation to the declaration um, to make it more narrow because it focuses specifically only on the error of law in relation to the EEA regulations. So now, there's a declaration that the EEA regulations, the Secretary of State was wrong about the EEA regulations, um, but no similar declaration in relation to the EU law issue. Next slide, please. In the High Court, we also um, agreed with the Secretary of State a quite a detailed consent order and it's appended to the High Court judgment on Bailey. And it's very helpful because it deals with some of the practical problems that arise from the court's judgment. Uh, the first thing is the Secretary of State has said she'll now go away and consider, reconsider the definition of a person with Zambrano right to reside under the EU settlement scheme rules in Appendix EU. Uh, and we've had indication in correspondence that she's intending, she's, that process is underway. Uh, there's no question of an appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, and she hopes to conclude that process and promulgate new rules by the 25th of April. So obviously, once those rules are promulgated, if they um, are, whether or not they change the existing provisions, that will give us a lot clearer idea uh, of what um, Zambrano rights will look like under the EUSS. In the meantime, the Secretary of State's agreed that she's going to put all of the applications on hold. So she won't determine any applications that are affected potentially by subparagraph B of the definition of the Zambrano right to reside. That's anybody who had limited leave to remain. Um, they've also, <clears throat> she's also um, confirmed that it's possible to make applications under both routes. So the fact that you make an Appendix EU application while you've got an Appendix FM application doesn't mean your former Appendix FM application is withdrawn and vice versa. Uh, that um, Zambrano applications, that she's going to extend time essentially for applications under the EUSS uh, on, under Zambrano until after she's concluded her um, reconsideration process. So the 30th of June deadline from last year will not apply for that particular group. Those that do apply in the meantime will be issued with a certificate of application that will confirm their entitlement to work, study and rent a place to live while they're waiting for their application to be determined. And those encountered by enforcement who meet potentially or are potentially affected by the court's judgment will be provided with a written notice giving them an opportunity to apply under Appendix EU. So quite helpful provisions that it's worth cross-referring to if you're advising people <coughs> who are affected and are awaiting the outcome of that reconsideration process.
sorry, Mike, you just cut out there at the end. Uh, are you moving forward or did you say you'd conclude? Am I still here? Can you still hear me? I can hear you now, yeah. Yeah, I said next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's, and all it is to say is um, Simon and Bea are going to um, enlighten you uh, or give their thoughts on, on what might be next for Zambrano carers uh, and what uh, other potential options and potential issues. Bearing in mind, of course, that there's a lot we don't know until we get the outcome of that crucial reconsideration process on the 25th of April. Thank you. So um, I just want to, at this stage, we'll come back and cover some, some of these issues in more detail later. But at this stage, I just want to talk about two things. First of all, the uh, um, just to remind you uh, uh, what the point that both Nicole and Michael have made, uh, that we do not know what the Home Office's policy will be uh, or what their rules will be. Uh, and therefore, we can't say how they're going to be deciding these applications after the 22nd of April. We can discuss um, what they might do and we can look at the steps that people might want to take to protect themselves in the meantime um, but we can't be clear about what their policy will be um, and we can't be clear that their policy will be a lawful one so the rule last time wasn't lawful that's what the court of appeal has said uh, and it's always possible that the home office will act unlawfully again we don't know but for the time being i think we can look at um three groups of people um, the first group is people who already have an application pending under the European, under the settlement scheme. Uh, in th for those people, uh, um, there wouldn't seem to be anything that's very useful for them to do in advance of the Home Office publishing their new policy. Uh, we expect that once they publish their policy, there will then be an opportunity for people to uh, make representations to the Home Office. Let's suppose the Home Office introduces uh, a new condition, a new requirement. Uh, they they take some category that for Zambrano cases at the moment and they split it into two and they say these people we actually will give leave to these people we won't then they may need to have more information from Zambrano carers about which category they fall into we'll have to see but for people who already have an application um, at the moment we don't we don't or myself and Mike don't feel that there's anything useful that can be done um, let's suppose you don't have an application under the USS scheme um, and um, that then might there be advantages to you or one of your clients making an application under the USS scheme. If, you do, if the person doesn't have any leave to remain, then there is a clear advantage at the moment because they ought to be issued with a certificate of application that will give them a right to work. So that's a, a, a clear reason why someone who um, has a case to be a Sambrano carer and doesn't have any leave to remain uh, could benefit from making an application under the scheme. Uh, if the person does have uh, limited leave to remain, if they have leave to remain under Appendix FM, um, then at the moment it's not clear that there's any real advantage to applying under the USS scheme uh, um, at this stage. Um, there will be an opportunity to do so once the new guidance is published. And once it is published, people will be able to make a decision. Uh, do I think I'm covered by it? Do I want to try and argue that I'm covered by it? Yes, I'm going to make an application. Or actually, this definitely doesn't apply to me. It would be a waste of time me making the application. So that's, I think, from our point of view, how we see those people in, with applications that are pending. There's a smaller group of people who might have an appeal pending. Um, in the case of uh, appeals to the first tier tribunal, the tribunal has gone on allowing those appeals following the judgment first of Mr Justice Mostyn and then since then of the Court of Appeal uh, and um, as lawyers that's that's the approach that I've been taking has been to to invite the tribunal to allow those appeals uh, on the basis that at the moment the rule uh, 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 the rules that are being applied uh, under the USS scheme uh, are not lawful so in cases where someone is being refused because they have leave to remain uh, then the Home Office can't rely on that rule because it's an unlawful rule. And we rely on the case of Foster, decided in the House of Lords, which held that tribunals have the power to decide cases under the lawful rules and to decide which case, which rules are lawful. 
There are a small number of cases where the tribunal has allowed those appeals and the Home Office has appealed to the upper tribunal. Um, I have had two cases in which the, uh, I have had one case in which the Home Office withdrew their appeal. That was a case of a family who didn't have any leave to remain. They accepted that the tribunal, first tier tribunal had got it right. And a second case where the applicant does have leave to remain and the Home Office have written asking to withdraw their appeal. There's a third case in which a colleague of mine, Ag uh, Agatha Patina, is representing, which today the Home Office had applied to withdraw their application for permission to appeal on the basis that they accepted the Akintanya judgment meant the tribunal was right. And they've written today to withdraw their application to withdraw their application for permission to appeal because they now want to argue that while the Akinsanya judgment was correct, um, that they don't know what that means for the tribunal. Um, and they're very confused and they, they want the upper tribunal to look at it. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, but that's it's probably, a, I probably expressed it better than they did in their uh, application. So that's their position. They don't know what they're doing and they're buying time. Uh, and they're essentially trying to keep cases up in the air until the policy is published. So I think in those cases, uh, um, certainly I think people have strong grounds to push for the upper tribunal to refuse permission or dismiss any appeals. The Akinsanya judgment is clear. I don't see any legal argument that a tribunal can um, dismiss uh, an appeal under Appendix EU on the basis that somebody has leave to remain, because that's what the rules say uh, when the Court of Appeal has decided that that rule is unlawful, because then the tribunal would be applying and giving effect to uh, an unlawful rule. Um, but we shall see what the tribunal says if, if they get around to giving a judgment in the next six weeks before the new rules come out, at which point the Home Office may well want to try to argue that those new rules should be applied to pending appeals. So that's my bit. Bayer, do you want to take over on practicalities? Thanks, Simon. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the practicalities of submitting applications as a Zambrano carer. So including evidence requirements and late applications. Um, as has already been mentioned a couple of times, today the information we can provide is obviously restricted pending the outcome of the Home Office review. Uh, so I apologize if the information I go over now is already familiar to some of you. But, you know, hopefully it will be of some use, at least in terms of setting out what we do and don't know at this stage. So some of this draws from my experience. If you have anything relevant or different to add based on your own experience, please do put it in the chat or Q&A. Uh, so first I'm going to talk about how to make applications and the evidence required. Not much has changed since the June 2021 deadline in that respect. Can I have the next slide, please? So who can make an application potentially? If you are the parent or primary carer of a British citizen living in the UK and you were the parent or primary carer of a British citizen living in the UK before the 31st of December 2020, you may be eligible to apply. If you became the parent or primary carer of a British citizen after that date, for example, if your British citizen child was born in 2021, you're not eligible under any circumstances to apply under EUSS Zambrano, okay, regardless of what the Home Office do with the rules. Uh, next slide, please. So how to make applications. Applications for Zambrano care still need to be submitted on the paper form. The forms still need to be ordered from the uh, Resolution Centre, the EUSS Resolution Centre, by the number found on gov.uk. Uh, there's also an option to order the paper form using an online request, which is also on gov.uk. You need to order separate forms for each non-British dependent child that you want to be included in your application. It says here on the slide um, that the forms are applicant specific. Actually, I've recently been informed that, that this isn't always the case anymore. So you might receive a form with the applicant name, i.e. your name, for example, at the top, or you may not. Um, both types of forms are valid, and with or without the name at the top of the application form, the form is still Zambrano specific. Okay, so the forms can be sent to you 
via email or post, but if sent by email, they can't be returned by email. They need to be printed and returned via post. You need to provide hard copies of your evidence and original documents like passports, um, etc. So please do not send your passport or any important document to the Home Office without making a copy. Um, paper forms take about five working days to be sent through by email at the moment. Post is a bit longer. Of course, from previous experience, Many of us know that those time scales can vary quite wildly depending on demand. So there's nothing to stop you ordering a paper form now pending the result of the Home Office review. Next slide, please. Okay, evidence. So evidence that will need to be submitted. The evidence requirements remain the same with the addition of late application requirements, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Non-EEA nationals need to provide proof of identity and nationality and they need to evidence a continuous qualifying period for the period being relied on so the years spent as the primary carer of a British citizen in the UK. If possible applicants should also provide evidence that they meet the requirements as a person with a Zambrano right to reside. So evidence of identity, nationality um, and age of the British citizen whom um, the British citizen whom you care for. So evidence that they live in the UK, evidence of your relationship, for example, a birth certificate. You should also provide evidence that they are dependent on you, um, which can be maybe an NHS letter or a school letter. For settled status, applicants are required to submit evidence that they have been resident in the UK as a person with a Zambrano right to reside for at least six months in any given 12 month period for five months in a row. So for example, bank statements, pay slips, utility bills covering six months per year. The five years starts from the date the applicant became the primary carer of the British citizen. So whether that's the date uh, the British child was born or the date you became the primary carer if you were maybe not living with the child from the date of their birth. Um, and do remember that that period must have started before the 31st of December, 2020, okay? Anything less than five years will be an application for pre-settled status. Um, next slide, please. I'm just gonna say a couple of things about pre-settled status and public funds, mainly because I get a lot of inquiries about it. And actually it's quite um, relevant to quite a few of my own clients. So if you have less than five years as a Zambrano carer and you are advised that you're eligible to apply for pre-settled status, or become eligible um, following the Home Office review of Appendix EU, it's important to consider restrictions in recourse to public funds. Yes, that's benefits. Uh, the conditions for getting pre-settled status alone are not particularly onerous. Uh, it's just residence, even for a short time as a Zambrano carer. Um, so to get pre-settled status, you don't need to show that you've been working during that time, for example. However, when it comes to claimant benefits, the government brought in regulations saying that pre-settled status wasn't enough in itself to satisfy the residence condition for things like universal credit. So people with pre-settled status can still claim universal credit in some situations, but they have to prove that they have a stronger right to reside than just the pre-settled status alone. Okay, so such as being a worker under EU law, which is Ambrano Carer is not. So there are other potential options, but many Zambrano carers are unlikely to meet the conditions. So we don't know the result of the Home Office review at this point, uh, but if you do become eligible to apply under EUSS as a Zambrano carer, but only for pre-settled status, this is a really relevant consideration. Even if the Home Office review results in a rule change that allows um, those with leave to remain to make EUSS applications under Zambrano, if you are applying for pre-settled status rather than a settled status and you currently have recourse to public funds and you need to continue to have recourse to public funds, this application may not be feasible for you and your family. Okay, so it's really important to get legal advice before making any application. Next slide, please. Okay, we're just gonna talk a little bit about late applications. Guidance for late EUSS Zambrano applications is the same for all EUSS applicants making a late application. Uh, in all cases, a person may make a late application to the EU Settlement Scheme based on having 
reasonable grounds for failing to meet the deadline applicable to them. So for those citizens resident in the UK by the 31st of December 2020, the deadline for applications was, um, as most of us will be aware, the 30th of June 2021. So a late application is any application made after that date. If your application is affected by the Akinsanya judgment and the outcome of the Home Office reconsideration of the rules, so i.e. if you have another form of leave to remain or you're eligible to make an application under Appendix FM, um, if the reconsideration is favourable and you become eligible to apply under EUSS, the Home Office will provide an extension of time to allow you to do that. So this information about late applications isn't really applicable to you, okay? But for other late applications under Zambrano EUSS, EUSS sorry. Um, so for those of you who don't have another form of leave that still haven't applied, in addition to the other evidence that we already mentioned, you need to provide reasonable grounds for your late application. Uh, the newest version of the EUSS guidance, I think it's version 15, sets out quite a wide range of circumstances which would constitute reasonable grounds. Um, and includes things like uh, if you had a serious medical condition, um, if you were a victim of modern slavery or in an abusive relationship uh, where somebody is isolated or vulnerable, if they didn't have digital skills to access the application process, or where a person was unable to apply for compelling practical or compassionate reasons. So this reason is kind of a catch-all for all other possible scenarios. For example, uh, you know, a person might not have been aware of the requirement to apply because they had no internet access or limited English language skills, uh, lack of permanent accommodation, um, might have been released from incarceration or immigration detention after the deadline. And it also includes those who didn't apply in time because they might not have had the required evidence. So they might not have had a valid ID document in time and they didn't know that they could rely on an expired document. So an applicant making a late application will need to provide supporting evidence um which can include you know if if they can which would it can include a letter or a statement from a relative um carer care home explaining the barriers that prevented an earlier application so in general the more time which has elapsed since the deadline the harder it will be to satisfy the home office that there are reasonable excuse me that there are reasonable grounds for the failure to meet the deadline Therefore, it's really important if the current immigration uh, rules don't prohibit you from making an application, you should seek legal advice as to whether you should make an application now or in the near future. Um, where an application is submitted that is not valid for whatever reason, the applicant should be contacted by the caseworker and given an opportunity to provide the missing evidence or information. Yeah. Um, and then where an application is refused, on the basis that there are not reasonable grounds for lateness, the applicant can seek an administrative review of that decision or appeal against it. Next slide, please. Um, okay, and I'm just going to give a little summary of um, potential applications now, which I know Simon has, has just done, but just in relation to what I've been talking about. So as I've said, if you are a Zambrano carer, and you have been a Zambrano carer since before the 31st of December 2020 without any other form of leave and you haven't made an EUSS application, you need to seek legal advice quite urgently. This is because your Zambrano status is no longer valid since the 30th of June and those particular applicants will currently be in the UK without status. Um, if you have already made an EU settlement scheme application as a Zambrano carer and are still waiting for a decision from the Home Office, it's likely nothing will happen yet, um, as Simon said. So that's because the Home Office has placed most Zambrano applications on hold um, until they've completed and published their review of the rules. If you are contacted by the Home Office in the meantime and ask for additional information and documents, even if you think your application should be on hold, it's important to comply with those requests. Um, if your EU settlement scheme application as a Zambrano carer has been refused, you should seek legal advice about the refusal. And just finally, this is probably quite a big group. If you haven't made an application under EUSS yet, and you have been or are the primary care of a British citizen since before the 31st of December, 2020, uh, but you currently have another form of leave, um, 
you should seek legal advice once the Home Office review is complete. So keep in mind the date of the 25th of April. You can try and contact legal reps before that date, but just be aware that legal representatives are going to be waiting for the outcome of the Home Office review before they'll be able to advise you of the merits of making an application. That's it from me. Thank you, Bea. Thanks. Uh, Simon, there's just a couple of points I think you wanted to end on. Uh, if you could keep them relatively brief, five minutes or so, so we could leave some time for questions, that'd be great. If you're still there, Simon. I am still here. Great. Yes, happy to do that, just looking at the questions. So just to quickly try and address some of the questions that have come up in the Q&A, uh, um, and then to quickly turn to what might happen next in terms of legal issues. Um, who is a, a Zambrano carer? Um, what happens if, what's the situation if there is a British child in the family, but they weren't British on the 31st of December 2020, either because they weren't born yet, or because they were registered as a British citizen after that date? And my view is then that person was not and could not have been a Zambrano carer on the 31st of December 2020. That there does have to be a person who was a British citizen child at that date. Uh, secondly, in terms of can um, both uh, members of a couple who care for their children be joint Zambrano carers? The Home Office position is that yes, um, if neither of them is an exempt person, that is, has British citizenship uh, or indefinite leave to remain. So uh, in that situation, historically, the Home Office would have accepted that one of those people was uh, um, the, the, the person who, sorry, that both of those people were uh, Zambrano carers, um, and uh, uh, so, so in that situation, I think I think that the, what we've been discussing would apply to both of those people. Where uh, one member of a couple is a British citizen or has indefinite leave to remain, the Home Office position has been that the other parent is not a Zambrano carer under Regulation 16 if the ch ch children or the child would be cared for by the British citizen parent or the parent with indefinite leave to remain. Um, Akinsanya casts doubt on that because that requires ignoring the straightforward words of Regulation 16. And there is an appeal to the Court of Appeal pending in that case in a, called VELAJ, V-E-L-A-J, uh, where the Court of Appeal gave permission to appeal just after they gave the Akinsanya judgment, saying that the Akinsanya judgment um, gave strong reasons for thinking that that decision was wrong. Uh, in other words, that the re regulation is read literally and that whatever EU law says, the uh, right to reside under regulation 16 applies to both uh, members, uh, both carers, even if uh, one of them uh, has indefinite leave to remain or British citizenship. Um, and so that case will, may go to the Court of Appeal. The Home Office may change their minds about that issue in the light of Akinsanya. We don't know yet. Uh, we have to see. Last point, bio, non-biological fathers, um, can they be uh, Zambrano carers? Uh, answer uh, um, depends on the meaning of um, direct uh, relative uh, or um, legal guardian uh, in Regulation 16. Uh, my view is that um, if the person has parental responsibility, then as soon as they got that, they became a legal guardian. If they don't have parental responsibility, they may be a stepfather who married to the mother, uh, or they may be a psychological uh, de facto father who doesn't have any legal status. I think there's an argument that they're a direct relative, since the point of the Zambrano case law is not about legal relationships with children. It's about making sure that they don't have to leave uh, the UK. But those cases are pretty complicated. Back to you, Nicole. Thank you very much, brilliant. Uh, right, um, there was, uh, let's have a look. Uh, I think some of the questions that are in our Q&A field have already been posed uh, and answered some in writing. So do follow the, the written responses as well. Uh, and I'll go through and indicate where those are answered. I'm going to ask uh, first a question from the chair, just one point that I'd hoped we'd discuss, which is, are there any 
outstanding issues that you parked in the Akinsanya uh, original appeal that could become relevant in the future? Um, and if so, what might those be? Thanks very much for reminding me. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, uh, um, I got thrown answering the questions. So the um, Miss Akinsanya's judicial review argued that the Secretary of State couldn't lawfully distinguish between people who have leave to remain and people who don't, because that would be irrational and unfair, because then people who've gone through the process of applying for Appendix FM leave would be worse off than people who had either chosen to stay here without leave or who did not have leave because they had committed criminal offences. And so the argument, one of the arguments that Ms. Akinsanya made was that she would be in a better position if she hadn't, uh, uh, if, for example, she was subject to a deportation order, uh, because then she wouldn't have any leave to remain, but yet she would have uh, the Zambrano right to reside. Now, the court didn't discuss any of those issues. Uh, she, they gave Ms. Akinsanya permission to argue them, but they haven't yet looked at them, because the Home Office agreed that if we were right on the issues that they did look at, they would have to go away and reconsider the rule. So we expect to get um, a new policy um, in on 22nd of April. There may be new words in the rule. Uh, there may not be new words in the rule. It's possible that the Home Office will stick to that rule and say, we've thought about it, but that's what we like. Um, and in that situation, then there may be further legal issues going back to court in Ms. Akintania's case, challenging that rule on those legal arguments that haven't yet been decided. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Simon. Right, let's have a look at some of the questions in the Q&A box in the last 10 minutes or so. Um, so it looks like we've answered some of those live. Hassan previously asked a question which I answered about um, something along the lines, I'm not finding it at the moment, around the Home Office. Uh, are we aware that the Home Office has been refusing applications notwithstanding the pause in the consent order? And originally I'd, I'd commented that we know that there are refusals because there are the, the pause only relates to applications where Akinsanya is determined to be material to the outcome. And of course, not all applications will relate to that. Now, Hassan has said that they're familiar with uh, cases where the judgment is uh, relevant and uh, they're commenting that they're changing the narrative of refusal letters to state alternative carers can take up responsibility uh, for the British citizen child and of course this is linked very much to what Simon was talking about in the Velage case um, and uh, it doesn't surprise me for one moment that the Home Office is taking the opportunity uh, to apply uh, the policy uh, where those applications are being put through. Akinzanya might apply but of course the Home Office sees that there's a potential alternative carer and they'll refuse on that ground rather than the Akinsanya ground uh, and of course in those types of applications you might want to pursue appeals keeping an eye on Velage. I don't know whether anyone else wants to to make any comments on that particular issue. I mean I'm just looking at the wording of the consent order it says, it says the Secretary of State will not determine applications on made on the basis that the applicant is or was a person with a Zambrano right to reside and is affected by the court's judgment until she's um completed the reconsideration of Appendix EU. So I suppose they would argue that it's not affected by the court's judgment if they're refusing on other grounds. Uh, who knows? Uh, um, I, I mean, I, I think those people should should appeal uh, um, and probably uh, should, uh, um, given how much little time is left, uh, ask the tribunal not to hear their appeal until the new policy is out, uh, um, unless they think they can get it done before then. Um, just to say, I think there's a difference for two different kinds of cases. One is where there are currently two carers um, and there is no other available carer. Uh, in those cases, I think the, the, the regulation is very clear. They both have a Zambrano right to reside um, unless one of them has is British citizen or has ILR, in which case that person doesn't have the Zambrano right to reside, but the other person does. There's another category of, category of cases where the Home Office is pointing at someone who's not currently a carer, grandmother, someone else, and saying, oh, your child can stay with them. Now, I think that's really unusual. But if they were doing that, that's not a case where Regulation 16 says definitely the person has a Sambrano right to reside. 
Thanks, Simon. Uh, we've got a question from Abby, uh, uh, and this is about the availability of, of legal advice and assistance in this space. And so, I mean, Bayer's made clear about that, that it's difficult to advise uh, at the moment. And I think there have been a few questions about, you know, is it worth trying to get advice at this stage? Um, I think the difficulty, my view, is that, you know, come the publication of the review, if the Home Office makes a decision to only allow late applications within six months uh, six weeks of the publication which is basically uh the minimum that they're required to give that's not a lot of time in order to get advice and to submit an application so i i think certainly for for very hard press services like rights of women's it's not likely that all of our service users would be able to get advice from us within that six week period so that there is some very difficult decisions that individuals will have to make as to whether they want to submit an, uh, an application protectively even before um, the, the review has been published, um, judging perhaps that there may be insufficient time to understand the implications of the review and submit the application. We simply don't know because we don't know how long the Home Office is going to give people um, to, to submit uh, late applications after the publication of the review. So it's really finely balanced. Um, and in terms of, I'll let other panel members sort of comment on that because these, these are all individual views, I think, that we have. A list of organisations, the Home Office is still uh, funding organisations through their grant funding scheme to provide EUSS advice. Um, those grants are currently due to end in March, but the Home Office is actively seeking to offer further funding to existing grant funded organisations. Um, so that is a possibility. Not all of those organisations will be able to provide advice on Zambrano because it's only OISC level two and above. So individuals would have to identify from that list those organisations that are OISC level two. So your law centres, um, will be doing this air center here for good um, on that list IOM I think on that list a level two as well a few a few others uh, and of course you can apply for legal aid if you uh, if you might have time as well um, but other than that those are those are the main points does anyone else want to comment on advice issues um, I mean yeah it's just tricky isn't it there's not really there's no right answer I know that at the law center we wouldn't be taking on cases now of the USS whose outcome is directly affected by this reconsideration in almost two months time. Um, but, you know, I, I could see a comment a little bit further down saying why some solicitors pressuring people with leave to remain under Appendix FM to apply under Zambrano. Um, I mean, and spend money on legal fees. Yeah, I mean, if I, that sh shouldn't really be happening and, um, you know, make sure a legal representative is advising you on the merits of an application as well. You can always get second opinions, right? I think that the difficulty here is legal representatives are, are very aware that this is a potentially once in a lifetime opportunity for a really vulnerable cohort of migrants that have been treated badly by the Home Office for so long. And when the EUSS came about, there was this free application route that offers a route to settle status to resolve so many of these problems that individuals have grappled with so much. So we as lawyers are desperate to try and get people onto this route. So I'm that where of course there will be you know um, some unscrupulous practitioners I think a lot of the concern of practitioners is to make sure people don't miss out on this potential opportunity because once it's gone it will be gone uh, and, it, and it can't necessarily easily be opened up again so it, these are not none of them are very, very easy decisions to make unfortunately um, right uh, let's look at some more questions uh, Sonia has a client who has FM leave no Zambrano applications made uh, so can understand, can wait to see the new rules. In the interim, she's going to get refugee status and five years leave to remain, having had an uh, asylum appeal allowed. Do the panel have any thoughts about whether a person can have ILR under the USS and retain refugee status? I don't see why not. I've certainly got views on that, but I'm sure no one wants to listen to mine. Um, do, does anyone on the panel want to speak on that first? I agree with Sonia. Yeah. Refugee say status is a different thing than leave as a refugee, right? Exactly. There's yeah. the two things. I mean, what, what I would say is there's, there's, it's not really arguable that the EUSS status 
is different from the EU withdrawal agreement rights in the context of Zambrano carers. I mean, it might be actually, um, I mean, I say it's not really arguable in the sense that Zambrano carers are not included under the withdrawal agreement. Uh, so for, for some people, it's arguable that EUSS status should be sort of almost distinct to the EU withdrawal agreement protections. Uh, that's a weaker argument, I think, in respect of Zambrano carers potentially. Um, but yeah, any other comments on that? No? Um, right. Brilliant. Um, I great. Just, um, just I answered one of them. Valag is heard on the 10th to the 12th of May. That's when it's listed for. Brilliant. Um, Grace's question about possibility of requesting a new COA. Uh, that's the certificate of application as the one she was issued back in 2020 and struggling to rely on it. Um, I, If you perhaps, Grace, the issues around certificates of application, I think they should be open-ended. There's no end date to certificates of application. Um, most people should have a digital one by now. If not, you can explore with the Settlement Resolution Centre um, whether it's possible to get a digital certificate of application if, if one hasn't already been set up for you. If you had an email account, it's, most people were transitioned over to digital COAs as well. If you haven't, double check, check whether you can log in to view and prove with your email address um and uh, passport number or application number see how you get and otherwise try the settlement resolution center again i would say um right um got time for maybe i a answer the more. last one um which is uh the home office isn't appealing to the upper tribunal uh, um i mean i so, so this this is you won your appeal at first the tribunal the home office isn't uh, trying to appeal it um, I would be tempted. I think it depends on whether or not you have leave to remain. Uh, if you if you don't have leave to remain, uh, then I th I think there's a very powerful case that the Home Office should be implementing that decision immediately, with the grant of leave to remain under the EU under the EU settlement scheme, because you're not caught by the argument they made in Akinsanya. If you do have leave to remain, I suspect you're going to. It may be hard to persuade the Home Office to grant you any leave to remain before they have completed their policy reconsideration in six weeks' time. Um, but um, I wouldn't want to say that it's impossible that they would do that. And I wouldn't want to say that it's impossible that you might have a legal argument uh, uh, that they should do that. Um, but I, I don't think here that we can I can express any view one way or the other about how likely it would be to work. Sorry. Oh, and um, one there's one that's a quick one. So Dave Stamps, uh, Dave, your question about, um, so Dave Stamps said, that Zambrano carers didn't need to apply for anything. They got the right to reside automatically, inherently. And he's quite right, yes. Uh, and first of all, the Court of, of Appeal recognises that as soon as your leave to, end, leave to remain ended before the 31st of December 2020, right? That's what I'm talking about. Then, um, then immediately a right to reside arose under EU law and in fact, what we now know, thanks to the Court of Appeal judgment, is that at any time when you met the conditions of being a Zambrano carer, even if you also had limited leave to remain, you were at the same time automatically holding a Regulation 16 right. Remember Mike's distinction, EU law and Regulation 16. So all of those people had it, even though they didn't know it. But the challenge we're facing is what good is that now? And that depends on what the Home Office is saying there in their new policy. It comes out in, in 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 six weeks, hopefully, and if needs be, what the court says about the lawfulness of that policy or what it means. Okay, we'll squeeze in one more, which is I think a question around Section Three C leave about a group of people that had, say, Appendix FM application. Um, and they made their EUSS Zambrano applications, but because it, they've been waiting for so long, their leave is about to expire. Um, watch sort of the, the issues there. And uh, there, as a, as a matter of immigration law, uh, when, if your leave expires, because you have an outstanding immigration application for leave, Section 3C will automatically extend the existing leave you have for as long as um, the Home Office takes to make 
make a decision and as long as there is an in-time appeal to the conclusion of that. However, that is a risky strategy just to rely on Section 3C leave and individuals in that situation should get advice about whether they should be concurrently at the same time, that is, applying to extend their Appendix FM leave. Generally, at this stage, it's generally always going to be a good idea to apply to extend your FM leave at the same time uh, because there's there's too much risk sitting in that EUSF application. Anybody want to add anything to that? Agreed. No, I agree. Right. Any final words um, from any members of the panel? We're not going to be able to get through any more of the questions, but final thoughts. Uh, hopefully we'll be back after the, um, the review, but anything beyond that? Um, I'll just say quickly, please do keep an eye on the Hackney Law Centre website. When there are updates, they will be put straight on to our website. Um, so keep an eye on it and do like look in around the 25th of April for sure. Yeah. And if people feel that uh, it would be helpful for us all to come back, maybe, I don't know, early May, once we've absorbed um, the review outcome, let us know if there is a feedback form at the end of this or in, in some other way, let us know that it would be helpful for us to come back and, and talk some more about the review. That's it, folks. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I wish you a lovely evening. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.